This episode, our super duper EU battery is going to get a shock as we zap it full of energy, zap it full of EU, and fix all of our power problems for the foreseeable future. Oh yes, welcome back everyone to Greg Tech New Horizons, episode 66, season number 2. And in this episode, we're going to invest in the XL gas turbine. After, in the last video, we fully automated nitro benzene. And benzene, as I'm sure you're all aware, is the fuel source we've been using since the medium voltage age, burning through various gas turbines to generate us power, to generate EU. In this case, we're using large gas turbines, as you can see behind me. We have 15 here in the void base and 5 still in the overworld. Recently, about 5,500 of you guys said that you were playing some form of Greg Tech, which is awesome. It's super cool to hear about all of your experiences with Greg Tech, both on Discord and here in the YouTube comments. And if you haven't already joined, then consider checking out the Discord to share your worlds. The link will be in the description as always, and I look forward to seeing you there. But that also meant that 40% of you responded you would never touch Greg Tech, which is fair enough. This is my favourite way to play the game, but it can also be a lot to handle sometimes. Which is why I've taken a short break to recharge my own batteries before we recharge our energy network here this episode. So it's been a few days since I finished up the last video, and although I haven't recorded much, I have been busy in the world on and off over the last couple of days. So let us begin with a recap of all the changes and preparations made for this episode of Greg Tech New Horizons. So the XL gas turbine is going to need rotor blades, and similar to the LGTs, we're going to continue to use high speed steel E. So the first thing I did was batch over 700 HSS E to make up the remaining ingots we need to craft 12 more large rotors. At just over 60 seconds an ingot, that was going to take a while, so in the meantime I considered some power logistics. How are we going to send power from the turbine into the battery, and then distribute that EU into the power spine? Well, we're going to need some energy hatches, dynamo hatches, and transformers. So I crafted up a 64 amp IV to LUV transformer to feed a 64 amp IV dynamo hatch. This is a bit overkill as the turbine will only output up to 16 amps IV power, but there is good reason for making this, which I'll explain shortly. I also made up more high amperage LUV transformers and a 64 amp IV energy hatch. Next, I noticed we were short on benzene still, and one of the things we can do to fix that is make up the rest of the fluid extractors, which recycle the charcoal into more wood tar which is then distilled into benzene. At the end of last episode, we only had one fluid extractor, medium voltage. So I went ahead and made up 56 more. Quite an expensive craft, but it takes us from only 800 litres every six seconds up to 48,600 in the same amount of time. Gotta love the processing arrays. I did notice at some point the HSSS and EBS had stalled, and that was due to a shortage of helium. We use helium in the recipe to cook the ingot to reduce the EU cost. And helium we make from endstone dust, farmed from Yellowstone Lily, and that is centrifuged in the overworld for helium. The machine, as it turns out, had stalled, and the fluid output was also still collected on the old P2P system. So I moved the fluid storage tank to the void from the original position in the old base. I also gave the machine an ME hatch to cache the excess helium. So that fixed the EBF issue and restarted the HSSE. While waiting on some of the blast furnaces, I spent more time with breeks populating the rings of flour. I added some more spruce bonsais and sugar beets, and uh, the spruce bonsais again are one of the primary inputs to the benzene production system. And then finally, I worked on crafting up the rest of the components for this XL turbine. It's quite an involved craft as it's a large multi-block, and I made sure to add recipes where we could. 
but besides waiting on more things cooking in the EBF, it was manageable. Expensive, but manageable. All right, guys, let's get started. I've taken a few days off. I've recharged my batteries. I hope you enjoyed that little time lapse there to get you up to speed. Uh, that was, uh, well, I recorded the last clip of that yesterday, so I did realize when I was editing that I completely forgot about the casing blocks for this large gas turbine. <laughs> so I have, like, the rotor assembly, we have the turbine shafts, we have all the, the transformers and dynamo hatches and energy hatches, the muffler hatches. Oh, we do need, we do also need uh, fluid input, right, for nitrobenzene. But yeah, I forgot about the 392 reinforced gas turbine casings we need for the XL. And uh, yeah, as you can see here, this turbine does not accept benzene. You have to upgrade it to nitrobenzene, which we already have done here. We have 7.9 million, but this has been turned off since last episode, so it's normal that we're not crafted anymore. Although, fortunately, with the upgrades to the fluid extractor, we're now way, way capped on benzene. Maybe, uh, actually, let's get the craft ready for this uh, reinforced, reinforced casing. How many was it? 392? We can craft that many, right? Surely. And I, I think there's a lot of EBF recipes in this as well, so I should have probably had this going. Yeah, look at all this stuff. 2,000 stainless... 3,000 stainless steel. 500 regular steel. Black bronze. 800 blue steel. 1,600 of this in Colloy DS. Actually, it's uh, closer to 2,000 DS. Oh, man, yeah, things are starting to get quite pricey, but hopefully it should start without any issue. Let's... Uh, Begin. Let's begin. Anyways, so uh, yeah, on benzene, we are starting to buffer it a lot, and I'm really happy that I added the the ME output hatches on these machines, since look at this, that's 2.5 million just in that hatch, 2.9 million in this one, 1.3 million in that one, 2.8, so yeah, we, are, <laughs> we have so much benzene. Um, I'm not going to turn on the, the chemical plant just yet, because we have to make some changes to our energy network. Yeah, it's coming along here nicely, but for what we're about to do here, I think all of the power in the base is going to go out, so maybe we should have paused this for now. Actually, yeah, let's pause the blast furnaces just for now. Okay, so our supercapacitor is our multi-block battery. This is how we uh, buffer power before it's sent on the main power spine throughout the rest of the base and distributed to all the machines. This green line here is the output line, and the two white lines are the insertion from all the turbines. So uh, we have one insertion line coming from this set of turbines on this side, and then one coming from the remaining five on the other side. We're supposed to have another five turbines here, but those are the ones in the overworld, and we'll eventually move them over here. Um, but this line is set up to handle the amount of power coming from these turbines. It's not, however, set up to handle the extra power which we're going to get from the large gas turbine, which is going to be placed right here. I have space for four. I don't know if we're going to end up crafting four. Um, we will see, I, I suppose. But yeah, for, for today, we're going to only start with one. Um, but we're going to plumb in the capability for us to handle two. And if we want four in the future, then we'll have to switch up some of the cables under here. But um, yeah, as I said, this thing is going to be capable of outputting 16 amps of IV power. There's going to be a lot of numbers thrown at you guys in the next couple of minutes, so just bear with me. <laughs> I'll try to make it as easy to understand as possible. Um, so yeah, 16 amps of IV power, we need to be able to handle that for the insertion. But let's first fix the problem that we were having throughout the rest of the base, which is not sending enough amperage um, through the main power spine. You'll, you might remember here at the Platinum Line that some of the machines kept turning themselves off um, in a few other locations as well, just because we are not sending enough amperage through this green cable. So right now, this thing is capable of sending 4 amps of LUV. So if we follow all the way back to the battery here, this thing is receiving its power from the battery and uh, we're sending into an IV high amp transformer. So... I did not mean to do that. Do you guys recall? <laughs> do you guys recall in the time lapse when I said it was a bit overkill to make a 64 amp IV dynamo hatch? Well, that's because we're going to recycle this one. So this one is only 16 amps coming out, coming out of the battery. We're going to pull this out and add the 64 amp IV dynamo hatch, right? And that is going to have to go into a 
insane power transformer, this one here, of which I had to make like four or five of these things, because that's also used in the 64 amp energy hatch. I mean, check out just, check out some of these recipes here. This is just, <laughs> it's so much tungsten steel and tungsten. Like, we need an insane power transformer for each one, and this is the high amp transformer, right? Which takes a regular transformer, which takes an IV machine hull, right? Lots and lots of tungsten steel here, plus tungsten cable, plus nichrome coil blocks for all these things, and this is just for one, and that's used for the 64 amp, right? The 16 amp is a similar situation. Also uses a transformer, also uses a 4 amp energy hatch, also uses a regular energy hatch, which is superconductor IV wire, and iridium. And then, yeah, I made a couple of those things, plus the, plus the, plus I don't even know. <laughs> Just expensive stuff all around. So yeah, we, we want to send 64 amps of IV power. Remember, dynamo hatch is the extraction point, so this is the main power spine. So we want to go into a insane power transformer. Right, hold on. 16 amp to 64 amp. Yeah, no, that's right, that's right. 64, 16 amp to 64 amp, but we want this in transform up mode. So we want to go from IV to LUV. So IV from the battery into LUV power spine. And uh, you might also remember that we went up to 4X vanadium gallium cable, which was a bit overkill since we were only supplying four amps, but this is capable of carrying 16 amps. And uh, right now this overkill situation is now paying off because it means we can just plug this straight into the existing cable. No explosions, right? No explosions anywhere. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, all the machines are going to turn off though since they just didn't receive enough power there for a couple of minutes, but uh, yeah, we're going to have to switch everything back on manually. But yeah, this is where it pays off to uh, future-proof the power spine. So uh, I'm really glad we went for 4x vanadium gallium from the start. And so we can supply 16 amps now on the main power spine. Let's just double check some of these machines here. I think it would have only turned off if it was running at the time. Uh, because remember, all of the transformers have an internal power buffer. And of course we have transformers all over the place here. To transform down from LUV to, well, IV then EV, EV to HV, HV to MV, HV to MV, yes. Mm, I'm not really sure if we're going to be able to find one. Lots of the output buffers were presumably full. Maybe this one. Yeah, this is an example right here. The centrifuge turned itself off, which is... Yep, and the processing array. And this thing. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of them off by now. But maybe we should just keep them off, just because we're still messing around with this power network. Ah, uh, you know what? Let's go ahead and turn the blast furnaces on. Because we do need that, we do, we do need our casing blocks for the multi-block. Okay, so making the switch here means we've freed up a 16 amp IV dynamo hatch, which we are going to place on the XL gas turbine. So this is what's going to feed energy into the battery, right? So let's just put this, I think it can go anywhere on the multi-block. I'm not sure it's going to say here, it just says any four dot hint. I think that's referring to the hologram projectors. In the preview here in NEI, it has it at the top, but I think it can be any casing. So ideally we have it in the bottom middle somewhere over here. So 16 amps of IV power, and uh, that is going to go into a transformer. So we want to transform high amp transformer, yeah, LUV to IV. And uh, yeah, just as a reminder, every four amps of the next year is one amp of the previous year. So for example, uh, four amps of LUV is one amp of IV, and therefore 16 amps of LUV is four amps of IV, which we're gonna transform up to here. Slap it with the soft mallet to put it in transform up mode. So now we're taking uh, four amps of LUV, and this will go on some vanadium gallium cable. And this is gonna be our insert line, right? Into the battery buffer. Yeah, let's just take it straight across. We need to be careful of this line. We do we do not want to mix up these lines. Even though they're both LUV, we want to keep the power line, the power input line to the battery separated from the main power spine of the base. Okay, so now once we get to this point, this HSSG cable is the other insertion from the turbines, right? So this this takes the power from these, and these generate one amp of IV power each. 
So this is IV power, despite it being HSSG cable, which is, uh, I think, LUV cable, but we just didn't have the platinum available to send it through IV cable at the time. Yeah, this is 16 amps of LUV power, um, but it's actually IV power because it's coming out of extreme transformers. And remember, you can send higher tier power through lower tier of cable. No, wait, that's the wrong way around. You can send... <laughs> no, you can't do that. You can send lower tier of power through higher tier of cable, which is what we're doing here. This is only IV. So what we want to do here is, first of all, turn off the turbines, just so we don't waste power. And then switch this out here. And we'll take out all this HSSG cable. We're going to leave the other side, though. We're going to leave this power in input line. Since the XLs are on this side of the base, the south side of the base. But we are going to merge the XL gas turbine input line and also these turbines input lines. Um, so we want to transform IV power up to LUV. So we need another IV high amp transformer here. Right, and this is also going to be in transform up mode. 16 amps of IV power into 4 amps of LUV. But actually, we can put this in half mode. So this way it's only doing 8 amps of IV into 2 amps of LUV. Since uh, if we count this out over here, we have 5 turbines and each one is 1 amp of IV. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 amps of IV. Plus we have space for another 3 large gas turbines, which we may or may not add. But uh, that would take us up to a total of 8 amps IV. Which works out perfectly here for this high amp transformer. So now we can safely merge both of these cables together. Um, and we'll have to remove the rest of the HSSG. And also switch out the energy hatch here on the LSC. Since right now I think it's only capable of 16 amps of IV power. Yeah, 16 amps of IV power, which is not going to be enough anymore. Yeah, so now if we count this out, we're going to have 4 amps from each XL gas turbine. So that's 4 8 amps here. Plus another 2 amps from the large gas turbines. Plus another 2 amps from these ones here which are not in place yet so that's another four amps so that's 12 amps of luv which is going to go all the way up here yeah and 12 amps of luv is going to be 48 amps of iv which means that this thing this energy hatch here is no good since it can only handle 16 so we need a 64 amp iv energy hatch to insert the power here which should form the multi-block again yes it does and therefore we need another insane power transformer to take us back from luv to iv and you might be thinking why we don't just craft the LUV energy hatch. Well, the LUV energy hatch does need the... Yeah, we need the assembly line for that to craft any LUV stuff. So we have to transform back down to IV to insert into the battery. Oh, actually, is this going to cause problems if we have two transformers next to each other? Yeah, we're going to have some issues here since if we place the transformer on this one, this also counts as the input face of this of this transformer. So actually, I wonder if we can place a plate on the side. Like, does doing that disable this face of the of the block? I think it does, right? Like, that blocks power from going across. Yeah, guys, let me know in the comments if, if you know for sure this does work. I think for now, just to be safe, I'm going to move this over. But I'm pretty sure that would work, right? I just don't want to risk it at the moment. So, uh, oh, what was actually placed there? Oh, no, blast furnace shut down. <laughs> yeah, energy hatch. Reform this thing really quick. I do also have a, on the recommendation of one of you guys, I do have a machine controller on the LSC, um, which is just disabled with redstone, which means that anytime it's broken, it's going to try to turn itself back on automatically because it doesn't ever get a redstone signal from the top side. Yeah, let me know if the situation here with the aluminium plate is going to work to block the side of the transformer. Um, and I'll move it over again. But for now, we're going to go here. So this is a maximum of 12 amps through the vanadium gallium cable into a 16 amp transformer LUV to IV and then 64 amps into the 64 amp energy hatch of the LSC and that should be capable of taking the power of our power insert line which is now also going to be a green cable since it's LUV yep all of this is going to be LUV let's also switch the blast furnace back on and that also did void a few ingots, so we're going to be short a few ingots. It looks like it's still doing blue steel dust. Although, you know what? It's actually getting through this craft at a pretty fast clip. 
Yeah, and we're going to be missing a few blue steel, so let's just request like 10 ingots manually for the ones that it, we're missing a recipe. Somehow we don't have the recipe for rose gold, which is circuit 2 in a mixer. You are going to go in here. And now we can also plug the turbines on this side back in. So they should now be outputting their power into this line. They should now all be live. And we should also see power in this transformer on the insert line. And on the extraction line. Yes, it has energy in the buffer. Alright, excellent. Now we've adjusted everything, we should be capable of uh, receiving the power from this XL. So all we need to do now is build the multi-block. Sorry that took a while, I just wanted to make sure we did not explode the whole base. Uh, I think we were relatively successful, we only avoided a few blue steel, which is not the end of the world. Oh, and the other thing is, we're going to have to craft a controller block, of course, which means we need an extra large gas turbine. And then we have to run that through an IV assembling machine. Breakthrough circuit 18, molten tungsten steel, large gas turbine, nitinol 60 platen, nitinol 60 screw, quantum processor, Oh, and 19 all 60 gears as well, which I missed. We do have them though. There we go, 60 seconds. Right? Yes, yeah, 60 seconds. 60 seconds though is nothing. I've been waiting hours and hours and hours for this stuff. I mean, like, for the rotor assemblies, this is all four circuit, four quantum circuits each, plus, uh, <laughs> plus a bunch of this stuff that we've you've probably never seen before. Like, it's mainly just that our auto crafting is not really up to par right now. And uh, all of this stuff needs an upgrade, and I cannot wait to start the auto-crafting facility, which we should be able to do in the next couple of episodes once we once we fix power. But, uh, oh, it was sent back to the AE system. We should now have our XL gas turbine, which should be a quest once we pick up the reinforced casing. 392 reinforced gas turbine casing. Quest. Aha, yes. Turbo gas turbine. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I have a seven by nine here, so I miscounted, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll ignore that. We can definitely fit a seven by seven here. Yeah, so this will be the footprint. So the XL gas turbine is capable of running as fast as 16 gas turbines with the space of only 12. Um, and I think the rotors do also spin a bit faster as well. Every XL turbine can hold 12 turbine items inside, which we also do have crafted. We should have, yeah, 12 HSSE large turbines. Yeah, every XL turbine can hold 12 turbine items inside in the 12 rotor assemblies, but their total speed is 16x higher than the regular multi-block equivalent, i.e. 16x higher than uh, the large gas turbine, a single large gas turbine. Make sure all the turbine items inside are of the same material, which we do have. We have all HSSE. And make sure you can provide enough input to match the flow rate that the multi needs. So remember for the these large gas turbines, we do have fluid regulators here to make sure they're getting an um, exactly 260 litres per second. Um, you want to feed it the exact amount of fluid that it needs to run one one cycle, I think. And right now, I have no idea what the flow rate is on this thing, but let's build it first and then we'll find out. I hope it's going to let us auto build. Maybe, maybe. I think so. Oh, that is awesome. That is awesome. Okay, it's going to be missing a few blocks here. Yeah, we're a few casings short. I presume because we do not have, we don't have like, uh, yeah, fluid inserts yet and we don't have enough muffler hatches on it. I think if I remember right, it needs four muffler hatches, one on each corner, here and here, and that frees up some casing. And then we also need fluid insertion. We need a maintenance hatch, which I might have had in my inventory, although I'm not sure where it placed it. Maybe not, let's just place a maintenance hatch right here. And then the last thing we need is fluid insertion for the nitro benzene fuel. Uh, so let's get like an IV input hatch. And we can also go ahead and feed the large turbines into the rotor assemblies. There should be six on each side, making 12 large turbines. And now we're going to have to figure out the flow rate, which we can do with some math actually on the large turbine. Oh, lovely. There's a lot of numbers there. Which one are we supposed to be looking at? I think we want the turbine efficiency and the energy from gas flow. 
All right, we're back about 30 minutes later. It took me so long to try to get this thing formed, but I think we've got there. Uh, we just need to do the maintenance. Apparently, we cannot have the dynamo hatch underneath. It has to be on the side here, and we also have to give it an input bus. I'm not really sure what for, but we're just going to hide it like that. We have, of course, the maintenance hatch. We have the input hatch. And uh, yeah, I've moved the power to the side here. So we have a wireless connector here, which we're going to bind to here, which is on the subnet. Oh yeah, it's on the subnet, that's right. Yeah, we do not want to bind it to there. We want to instead go underneath and we'll just use the same P2P channel, yeah, that feeds benzene to the original gas turbines, which are going to be switched out with nitro benzene. I need to remember to do that. But we have this P2P here, which is labeled as benzene fuel. So we're going to place a wireless connector. Actually, we can save some power here if we extend this along a bit. So wireless connector, and now it only has to go a couple of blocks to get past the transformer. Um, so now all we have to do is another covered cable into a fluid export bus, which, not there, which is going to supply our nitro benzene to the gas turbine. So we can request it here. Let's also give it some acceleration cards just to make sure it can supply enough. But we want to make sure that we can control this, right? So instead of doing any math, I just found the GTNH turbine calculator again, <laughs> which I'll provide a link to, but you can also find it, I think, on the GTNH website. And according to that, using nitro benzene in an XL gas turbine, we want to supply 48 liters per tick, which we can do with an MV fluid regulator on the input hatch. So we want 40, minus 48 liters per tick, which is 960 liters a second. Wait, does that have any nitro benzene in it? Okay, that didn't seem to get any nitro benzene straight on the hatch, so I've instead replaced it with a super tank, and then the input hatch here. We still have our fluid regulator, minus 48 liters per second, or per tick. And then, uh, yeah, we have a pump on the side of the tank. It's just an IV pump, uh, but it should still be regulated to 48 liters per tick because of the fluid regulator on the hatch. And then, uh, yeah, we're supplying nitro benzene in the fluid export bus and we have an extra buffer here of nitro benzene. Let's just lock this as well. So yeah, again, according to the calculator, we should generate 130,560 EU per tick. And we generate, I think, 120,000 with the 15 large gas turbines. So we're essentially going to double our EU per tick generation rate. Oh, and the game's giving me eggs again. <laughs> so let's do the, let's do the maintenance. Everything looks good. Let's do a backup as well. I did move the cable down here since I had to move the dynamo hatch from the center to the side. Um, but it kind of works out a little bit nicer since we don't have to dodge this wireless connector anymore. And I missed some paint on this covered cable here. Um, but yeah, finally we're, we're going to have to redstone control this as well. Since we want to only turn it on when the battery is low. Um, but let's just fire it up manually here just to test out if we're going to generate any power. Okay, it says it's generating power. The turbines are spinning. Okay, let's scan it. Or maybe, do we scan the controller? Oh, there's a lot of information here. Current speed is 18%. Um, we have, it looks like a buffer in the dynamo hatch. And then it shows us the pollution rate, which doesn't apply since we have pollution disabled. Probably generates 102,000. That doesn't sound right, but maybe it's just because it's not up to speed yet. Yeah, remember, these things, I think, work the same as the large gas turbines in that it does take a while for it to reach 100% efficiency and generate the maximum amount of power. There is also a fast mode on the XL gas turbine, which we're not using here, since that would change the flow rate and also the rate which the turbines take damage. Because eventually, remember, similar to these ones, we are going to have to replace the turbine, the rotor blades. Okay, so now we're generating, yeah, 48 litres per, per tick. We're generating 122,000. That doesn't sound right. We're missing something, right? Do they all have... Yeah, they all have large turbines. Let's just double check this. What does the energy monitor say here? We're generating 120,000 right now. Is that with... Or is the other turbines turned on right now? The large gas turbines? It looks like they're off. Okay, yeah, so 120,000 is just, just the XL. I don't know, maybe that's correct. I'm going to have to read up on that, but we also want to give it a machine controller. Yeah, machine controller enabled with redstone, and then we can connect this up to a wireless receiver. And this is also going to be on frequency 24. 
And uh, just in case you guys want to reference this, we're going to connect it to the same redstone network as the LSC battery, as the rest of the turbines. So we have a energy detector cover on these settings on the bottom of the LSC, and that goes into two dense red crystals. One is on power two, one is on power 11. So essentially when it gets to 20% full, all the turbines should turn on since it hits this knock gate and then flips the redstone latch, powering the transmitter on frequency 24. And then when it reaches a certain amount in the battery, it's something like 3 billion out of 4.2 billion. So most of the way full, then it should uh, power this redstone line and flick the latch back off, turning off the turbines. So we can test this manually with the manual override. That should have turned all the turbines on and it looks like it did. All the large gas turbines, including our XL, which should all feed into the power network, into the battery. So now we should see a much higher number here on the average input. Well, actually, this is a, over five seconds, so I'm not sure what it's going to go up to. 230,000. Um, I think some of the discrepancy that we're seeing is because we're transforming up and down. Um, and not all of the power is sent at once. So it kind of depends on how many amps it, the transformers send. It gets a little bit funny with how transformers work and like energy packets. Oh yes, 130,000 EU a tick. You guys see him over there? That's also Thomcraft Warp as well. <laughs> it's our imagination. Um, but look at this, we got 130,000. The issue was that you do not want um, the pump on the side of the tank. We want to rely on the fluid regulator to pull in the fluid. Still 48 litres per tick, and now we're generating the maximum amount. Yeah, I was wondering why the fluid buffer inside the machine was staying at, like, max, and that probably also means we want to switch out the input hatch with a lower tier of input hatch. Still big enough to handle 48 litres per tick, but uh, not so big that it buffers so much benzene to begin with, because I think when the machine is off, it's going to fill the buffer, similar to these ones over here. Okay, awesome. Let's switch it back on to redstone mode. I'll switch out the input hatch here, and we also want to switch on our nitro benzene setup, which means we can turn on the chemical plant, and I think we're safe to convert all of the benzene. Um, we do have chlorobenzene, which we are eventually going to pump from Mars. Uh, so as far as I know, we don't need benzene for any other system, and uh, we're safe just to convert it all to nitro. So this is going to spin up the LCRs, making ammonia, making nitric acid, making sulfuric acid, making distilled water, and then all of that is combined, yeah, all of that is combined in the chemical plant, sent to the output hatch, and remember, we're running this thing in parallel, so it should do eight recipes in parallel, I think it's only doing seven right now, so it might just be a throughput issue somewhere, I'll have to investigate, um, but this is all going to main fluid storage, and I don't think I mentioned last episode, but in main fluid storage, I've given an upgrade to the nitrobenzene tank, which is over here, and for nitrobenzene, we're using a super tank 5, which is capable of holding 64 million, compared with the regular 4 million of the rest of the tanks. I think the benzene tank, the original benzene tank, is the only one that had an upgrade on super tank 3. This one here is 16 million, but yeah, it's mostly all going to be converted into nitrobenzene. Oh, it's actually dropping right now. Is the turbine switched back on? It's not on right now. That probably means it's filling the hatch back here. And so, yeah, 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 we want to switch this. Yeah, I'm going to switch this to a lower tier of hatch. Yeah, we'll just go for an LV input hatch here. Again, 48 litres per tick, 960 litres a second. So it doesn't have to buffer so much when the turbine is off. And if I understand correctly, should get to the optimal flow rate much faster since the input hatch is going to empty. And then it's just going to be regulated with the fluid regulator. So yeah, now the buffer of nitrobenzene should be filling up again every now and then. 7.5 seconds per recipe, so we should see it every... It should go up. Yes, 4.5 million. Excellent. And I'm also going to have to go through every single machine in the base to make sure they're switched back on, since we were messing with the power network. And um, yeah, a lot of these are going to be switched off. Things in the platinum line as well. But remember, we did upgrade our power spine. So this is now capable of sending 16 amps of LUV power. And so we should be able to get the platinum line running again. Switch on ammonium chloride. Switch on all these machines again. Switch on ammonia. Switch on this LCR processing the combs, which we switched off last episode. 
This one is the LUV one, one of the biggest uh, consumers of power in the base. <laughs> nice, and we're back to consuming 80,000. Um, we might want to look at upgrading the battery as well, which I, I think I might consider doing. But we have now completed our objective. We have the XL gas turbine. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and switch out these uh, turbines for nitro benzene as well. We can burn nitro benzene in these ones. We just can't burn regular benzene in the XL. Um, and it's going to be a different flow rate as well. So I'm going to have to figure out everything and make sure it will work along with the power output. I think it's going to be able to handle it, but uh, yeah, I'll make any adjustments as needed. So yeah, one of potentially four XL gas turbines, but there is a few more things I'd like to do this episode. Firstly, I made sure to power on all the disabled machines in the base after we adjusted the power network. Then I swapped over all the turbines to burn nitro benzene instead of regular benzene. I drained their internal buffers into a big tank and converted the fluid export buses to provide nitro benzene. The optimal flow rate here changes from 13 litres a tick to 3 litres a tick in these turbines here as well. So I made sure to adjust everything to ensure that things were optimal. We also now have the turbines in the overworld running nitro benzene too. So overall we are much more efficient with our fuel as the turbines generate us the same amount of EU with much, much less fuel burn. Since the move to the void, we have also had some lingering fluid storage in the old base. And so I went through each remaining fluid and moved it to primary fluid storage in the new base in the void. It was mostly the plastics left over, polyethylene, polytetrafluoroethylene, um, along with things like oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen. And a lot of these still had connected P2P frequencies, so I made sure to swap the outputs of their production location to either ME hatches or interfaces. And this way we can just rely on the storage bus to move the fluids around after moving the tank and ditching P2P. Alright guys, another thing moved over from the old base. Uh, we're getting more and more efficient every episode. It's so good getting through some of these tedious tasks. Um, and there's still one more I would like to do this episode as well. We have a little bit of time left, but I think most of it will be cut out and we'll go through it next episode. Um, before we get onto that though, there is a few tanks you can see here. This is just some spare fluid. We have these on like low priority, so whenever the tank empties out, I'll just remove it from here. This is just to uh, yeah, run through the fluid first. And then we have some on this side. By the way, we're filling up this fluid storage quite quickly, but I don't suspect there's going to be that many more fluids. Um, and eventually we will build the multi-block fluid storage tank. So I think we're going to have enough fluid storage space. Um, but yeah, these ones here are from the distillation tower, which used to sit right there when we had the chemical plant in place. So I removed all that. The only thing that remains is the implosion compressor. But I think I might take this down as well, and we'll just rebuild it when we make the next rocket. But speaking of efficiency, we can also pick up some efficiency making radon. Um, so you might remember a couple of episodes ago when we set this up, I mentioned that plutonium was very precious. Uh, plutonium-239 dust. And there's two recipes for radon. Uh, well, actually, there's more than two, but there's two recipes in the chemical reactor. There is the tiny pile of uranium-238 with eight plutonium-239. And this is a 600 second recipe at ULV to give us 100 litres of radon. But there's also a 75 second HV recipe using 64 plutonium-239. And this gives us 800 litres, so it's way, way, way more efficient to use this recipe here. The problem is getting your hands on all that plutonium-239. Now that we have the tier 3 rocket though, we can access plutonium veins on Callisto, Ceres, Ganymede and Io. No, I was tier 4 planet, but yeah, on Ganymede, I think we do have our ore drill on a plutonium vein. And 
<laughs> yeah, we still have an issue here. It's getting through the backlog very, very, very slowly. There's tons and tons of stuff that needs processed here, but this is one of the things that... One of the big, big projects that's coming up in the next few episodes. Uh, ore processing and also uh, the auto crafting network. But yes, we should have some plutonium in here. We have 400. Are we wearing the full hazmat suit? Yes, we are. We have 400 plutonium now. So we can go ahead and switch this recipe over. Um, 37 and a half seconds. This is running at EV, I think. Um, so this was the 600 second recipe. Um, but we also don't need this auto workbench here anymore since we are not going to be using tiny piles. Yeah, it's a full uranium-238 dust and circuit 8. Well, we're going to have to switch circuit 8. And you know what? We can even switch this to a stalking bus um, instead of having to go into a regular bus. So we can craft up some more of these things here. These are such a nightmare to craft. We need to set up some molecular assemblers as well, which we'll do. We'll, we'll, we'll get some molecular assemblers set up eventually. Okay, some advanced cards into some acceleration cards. And we should be able to request our stocking bus. Perfect. Um, yeah, so we can remove all this stuff for the uranium. That. And that. And the input bus. And that. And we don't need this anymore either. Come on, little assembler, you can do it. You can do it. Make us an input bus. Make us an input bus. There's so many things, like so many times I just cut this out, but... um. I thought I'd show you guys my pain. Every time I want something, I'm just waiting on this crafting screen. It's such a nightmare. <laughs> we need overclocks, but now that we have the power to do so, we can definitely overclock our assemblers and make more assemblers and more machines overall. There we go, it's finished. Yes, yeah, so here we want to stock regular uranium. We don't have to convert it to tiny piles anymore. And we want circuit number 8. And since we have the extra plutonium, we might as well give it the full two stacks so that when the first recipe is finished, um, it gives us the dust as an output, right? Yeah, the input takes uh, plutonium ingots and it gives us dust as output, which we then send into a furnace and then back into the input. So we might as well give it two stacks of plutonium so that when the first recipe finishes, it already has the next full stack to run the next recipe. And then we, uh, yeah, we give it the air intake hatch, which has more than a full recipe worth of buffer in here. So it should be able to run the next one instantly. So yeah, again, much more efficient overall. Restart the machine. Um, yeah, so the next and final project for today is gonna be to move over crop processing. Yeah, there we go, 75 seconds. I think this is actually a HV, so I might overclock it still, but it's HV just because this furnace is HV. But yeah, overall we're getting much more radon per recipe. And it should start the next one instantly. Okay, cool. So the next project, as I mentioned, is going to be to do crop processing. And I want to start doing that over here. And this is actually a very important uh, thing to get moved over because this is our primary method of generating oxygen. It's also our primary method of generating helium gas, sand, platinum metallic powder dust, tungstate dust. Um, we have refined glue here as well, which is turned off on purpose. Also chlorine in this electrolyzer here, which uh, comes from salty root. And then we also have some extractors extracting glow flower into glowstone. Um, and we've actually built up a substantial amount of glowstone this way, 400k. Um, the advanced extractor though is one of those machines which is extremely expensive in that the uh, multi-block is the large processing factory. And I'm not sure we want to invest in this just for glowstone, so I think I might put it in a processing array. And uh, yeah, we'll just keep using the single blocks in the, inside the processing array. That way we get at least some parallelization. But we don't need to be faster than the rate that we generate crops at. So I don't know, we might just keep the single blocks. I haven't really decided yet. Um, and then also this electrolyzer here, which gives us hydrogen uh, from 1,2-dimethylbenzene, which it looks like we're out of right now. And uh, that also reminds me, I have to add some more ME output hatches to the distillation towers, which give us one two, one two dimethylbenzene. Um, so yeah, there is a few other machines here which generate us uh, passive things like rubber sheets and rubber rings, polytetrafluoroethylene bars and sheets, um, all this stuff we use in circuit production. But I think I'm just going to leave this as is because if we tear this out right now, um, we don't have a replacement for it. And... I want this in a different place. We're going to have this in the auto crafting room. 
so I think this will just remain here until we do auto crafting. I'm just going to focus on these machines here and the electrolyzer. So yeah, this should be relatively straightforward. Oh yeah, and by the way, check this out. We're now at 18 million nitro benzene and we're now capped on benzene storage as well. And this doesn't count, by the way, any of the ex external storage that we have, like next to the turbines. Um, so yeah, and I presume there's also some benzene cached in the ME hatches. So yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say that we fixed the power issue for now. This won't be the last power upgrade that we make. Um, I suspect we will have to make another upgrade in ZPM, or maybe even before that. I'm not sure. It kind of depends on how, on what we choose to prioritize. But um, yeah, I think I know what I want to do here. Let's just get all the machines moved over. And we are done for this episode at least. We have, what, uh, four electrolyzers, four processing arrays, two centrifuges, and two chemical reactors. And a chicken. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Alright, so starting at the first centrifuge here, we have uh, this one is for sticky resin, which we farm from stick reed, and we get raw rubber dust, plant balls, and refined glue. And I switched out all the bosses and hatches with ME bosses and hatches for the most part. There's a few exceptions. Um, and then, of course, all of the items go into super chests, at least the ones coming out of the passive systems. So we have, uh, yeah, all of these super chests are brand new. So we have things like sugar things like plant balls, things like raw rubber dust, sand, and glowstone. And all of this used to be in a big drawer network. Yeah, this monstrosity over here, which I emptied out into the super chests, into the main item storage. So these are now all empty, and in fact, we can get rid of all this stuff. Oh yeah, and the only thing I didn't passive was ice. We used to have ice on passive here for the bees, but we have 100, nearly 128k. And if we ever go through this, and then I think I might just add a pattern for it, to be honest. We only need the ice for the acclimatizer, and honestly we don't use that much, so if we ever run through the backlog again, then uh, yeah, we'll just add it back on demand. And I was over here at the hives a couple of hours ago, and I noticed that we had a bit of an issue, we had a bit of a mix-up, where some of the bees were actually cross-contaminating each other. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. That shouldn't be in there. <laughs> Dang it. It was a bit of an oversight on my part since I had the conduits on the same colour. Um, but I've went ahead and switched everything out now. So the self-feed is on separated colours. Um, so essentially the Flux Queen can never mix with the Certus Queen. Um, which is what happened before. But fortunately we don't have too many cases where the Alviaries are touching. Since most of them need their own biomes. So it's only it was only this one over here. The Industrious and Imperial. And then yeah, Redstone and... What is this? Zinc? But yeah, it's sorted out now. I, I separated the conduit colors and I also added some storage here recently. We got some more 64k ME storage drives just to try to give us a bit more space here. Next machine is for the endstone dust, which of course we farm uh, from Yellowstone Lily. And we're just using stocking buses to pull the endstone dust. And then everything is sent back to storage. And of course we get helium, sand, PMP and tungstate dust. And I actually went a bit above what I said I was going to do and added three extra machines, which I didn't plan on adding, but this is going to be to handle tungstate processing. So right now we have 41,000 tungstate dust. We get this from ore, we also get it from the bees, and we get it from the crops now, uh, from the centrifuge. And previously we used to process tungstate right here. It was an autoclave and two chemical reactors to give us eventually uh, tungstic acid dust which is then blast furnace into tungsten trioxide, and then blast furnace again for tungsten dust made into tungsten steel, or blast furnace with carbon for regular tungsten ingots. So this is very, very important for EV and above. Yeah, we go through so much tungsten steel these days, and uh, having to rely on that manual system in the overworld is no good. So we're going to add an extra processing array here. Yeah, we do still have to craft this machine processing array right here, and I've just yoinked one of the Lapitronic energy orbs from the overworld battery. Like, we have so many in there, but there's not a lot of power being used in the overworld anymore. So we can use them to craft the processing array. And I'm, by the way, I do know that it will be removed in later versions, but we still have months and months and months before, that, before these things are removed. Maybe even a year, I'm told, by some devs. So yeah, I think it is still pretty safe to rely on the processing arrays for now. We're going to steal this autoclave. 
And I think actually we'll have to overclock this processing array since we're giving it EV power. But um, this is an EV recipe and an EV machine. So if we add more autoclaves in here, then it's not going to have enough recipe or enough power to run the recipe in parallel. And yeah, only one machine in a processing array is kind of pointless. So uh, yeah, we'll have to overclock this to either IV or LUV. But yeah, we should more or less have everything set up here. We have a stocking bus, which we're going to pull in sodium and tungstate dust. And this will give us our sodium tungstate here. We also get a bit of lithium, which we're just going to send back to storage via the output bus. And the sodium tungstate fluid is just going to be passed via this fluid P2P into this LCR right here. For this recipe right here, calcium chloride plus sodium tungstate gives us shelite and salt. The salt we send to storage and the shelite we pass to the next chemical reactor to be mixed with hydrochloric acid. And we get our tungstic acid and we get all of the calcium chloride back. So the, this calcium chloride is fully recycled. It's just going to go back to our AE system and then be stocked here again. So yeah, the final LCR, we have hydrochloric acid being supplied with the AE system. Output bus and the input bus is going to receive uh, shelite dust, which we can also get from ore as well. So I was kind of considering putting this next to ore processing, but I mean, it's kind of a crop since we get tungstate from the crops and we get it from bees as well. So it could, it could have been in any number of locations, to be honest. There isn't really a clean way of uh, separating the machines out. So um, yeah, it's, I think it's fine here, to be honest. So uh, yeah, let's do the, the maintenance on all these machines. And we should just be able to turn it on and it's gonna give us automatic tungstate processing. Oh, and we were out of uh, soldering alloy wire. Now it should fix the maintenance. Yes, perfect. Switch this on, no valid recipe. Why is there no valid recipe? No calcium chloride, of course. Yeah, since this is fully recycled, we don't make it anywhere else. We just have to give it a little bit to work with and now it should run the recipe. And the last one for Shelite is gonna give us tungstic acid dust, perfect. So tungstic acid, there is only one use and that is to blast furnace. So I might actually consider setting up a little blast furnace here just for tungstic acid, but hmm. I'm not really sure. I'm, yeah, that might not be such a bad idea because we're going to end up with a lot of tungstic acid just sitting here. Although it is quite quick to do it on demand. So yeah, I'm not really sure to be honest. Anyways, moving on here. So we covered uh, these three machines and the two centrifuges. The next one is for the chemical baths uh, processing salty root. Salty root is farmed here. I added some more seeds along with the spruce bonsais and also sugar beets, which now have five or four full patches. So salty root gives us salt, rock salt, and potassium dust. No, saltpeter dust. Yeah, salt, rock salt, saltpeter dust, which is sent back to the super chests. This PA is for the extractors, turning sugar beets into sugar. Next one over here is for more extractors, turning glow flower into glowstone dust. And then uh, here we have hydrogen from the 1,2-dimethylbenzene. But since 1,2-dimethylbenzene is used in phthalic acid production, we have a fluid level emitter underneath, making sure that we have at least uh, 600 buckets worth before the machine turns on. So this is active with a signal and it will only receive a signal if we have above this number in fluid storage. So that way we keep enough dimethylbenzene to run the phthalic acid recipe before converting the rest into hydrogen. This one here is doing chlorine. Uh, so we're stocking rock salt here. Uh, we could also stock regular salt, which I might actually do, but I think it is going to lock on one recipe. Um, so I'm not really sure if there's a way to like alternate between these two. And so for the second to last machine, I think I've actually found a bug in the game. I'm like 99% sure it's unintended. Um, so we have a level emitter here, right? And I wanted to just keep a stock of sugar. Honestly, I don't even remember why I wanted to keep sugar. It's probably not necessary for sugar, but uh, would have been more useful in the rock salt. But yeah, anyways, for the sugar, it actually doesn't register um, that we have any sugar in the system, 8192. Um, and we do definitely have some sugar here. Yeah, 2717. That's just because I just turned on the PA over there. So yeah, we have like 2900 here. Let's just put this uh, level emitter down to 100. So we definitely have over 100 sugar in the system, right? And we want to level emit when levels are above. Um, but as you can see here, the level emitter stays off. 
And I found after some investigation that is because we have a sticky card on the storage location. Uh, so if we find the one for sugar, this one here, um, if we take out the sticky card here, the level emitter is going to instantly recognize that it has 3000 sugar. Right, you see that? Now it's turned on. I don't know why it's like that. I don't know if that's intended behavior, but I can't imagine it would be. The sticky card only ensures that sugar can only be stored here. I mean, it doesn't change the quantity that we have in the system in any way, so I don't really see why the level emitter shouldn't work um, with the sticky card, but apparently it doesn't, so yeah, we can't really put a level emitter here. And uh, yeah, to be honest, it probably isn't necessary for sugar anyway. We can just let this run and generate us oxygen gas. And yeah, in batch mode, we get 300 buckets per six seconds, which is such a good deal. So the last machine here is just one I moved over, actually. It's um, an electrolyzer, which used to be underneath a mixer on the other side of the base. Um, this one is just for lead zinc solution. And this solution just gives us a bunch of dusts and some water, which we trash. But lead zinc solution we get from making Indian dust over here. So it wasn't really necessary to move it. I just thought that... I, I don't know, I would move the mixer down and put the electrolyzer over on the other side. It doesn't really matter and yeah, like I said, there isn't really a clean way of splitting up your machines in the base since so many systems are intertwined together. So yeah, honestly when you think about it, all we have to move over now is the auto crafting and the ore processing. Um, and that is basically it. Um, all the other stuff is going to be incorporated into ore processing, like these machines here. These ones here are basically irrelevant now. This is just building blocks for the old base. And so we don't use any of these anymore. That sort of stuff does not need to be copied over at all. Um, but we can reclaim all this stuff. Um, we can reclaim like the P2P. We don't need to have this connected anymore. And yeah, even check in the original base here. I believe there's only one system which we have to transfer over, which we may or may not look at next episode. And that is silicon solar grade dust. Um, this I still fill, and this is still in L LV and MV machines, and we still go through so much of the silicon solar grade. Um, so that needs a proper place, probably next to the, the tongue state processing. Um, but this is now irrelevant. Titanium is now irrelevant as well. Although technically there is still a specialized line for rutile, which we do not have set up yet, so I might consider putting that together. But yeah, pretty much everything else is now obsolete, and oh nice. <laughs> nice, there's still 22 stacks here. That's excellent. That saves us all the time. Um, but yeah, I was just making up some more chemical dye, lime dye. We had some of the salt from the tongue state processing, which you mix with uh, sulfuric acid and some dye, and you get chemical dye. And then we fill that inside spray cans, and this is what we use to paint all the cable. Um, it turns out we've painted like thousands of cable by now, and these only have 512 uses. So yeah, we go through quite a lot of these spray cans, so I'm just batch crafting them. Mostly the lime, the blue for HV, and the pink for EV. There is one more thing left to do today, and that is to order a bunch of HSSG. I want to get these blast furnaces, uh, these coils upgraded from Nichrome to HSSG. So it's going to be 16 coils per blast furnace, and it's two stacks, well, two stacks of ingots per blast furnace, times six. So 120 ingots times 6 blast furnaces is 768 HSSG. And yeah, that's a whole lot of tungsten steel and tungstic acid. Which is kind of why I was prompted to... Yeah, let's just let's just start this. Kind of why I was prompted to set up the extra machines over in processing. Which should still be uh, processing the tungstate, right? Yeah, it's got a lot of dust to go through. So yeah, these blast furnaces are going to be kept busy for a while. 22 seconds per ingot. It's not too bad. Um, we do have these in parallel, and we have now the power to sustain blast furnaces and all the other machines in the base. But yeah, for now, that's going to be it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next episode of New Horizons.